New Caledonia. After weeks at sea, cramped into a troop ship, we were relieved to move on to land again. We piled into Marine Corps trucks and drove through the main section of Numea. I was delighted to see the old French architecture, which reminded me of the older sections of Mobile and New Orleans. The trucks sped along a winding road with mountains on each side. We saw small farms and a large nickel mine in the valley. Some of the land was cleared, but thick jungle covered much of the low areas. Although the weather was pleasant and cool, the palms and other growth attested to the tropical climate. After several miles, we turned into Camp St. Louis, where we would undergo further training before being sent up north to the combat zone as replacements. Camp St. Louis was a tent camp comprised of rows of tents and dirt streets. We were assigned to tents, stowed our gear, and fell in for chow. The galley rested on a hill just past the camp's brig. In full view were two wire cages about the size of phone booths. We were told that those who caused trouble were locked in there, and a high-pressure fire hose was turned on them periodically. The strictness of discipline at Camp St. Louis caused me to assume the explanation of the cages was true. In any event, I resolved to stay out of trouble. Our training consisted of lectures and field exercises. Combat veteran officers and NCOs lectured on Japanese weapons, tactics, and combat methods. Most of the training was thorough and emphasized individual attention. We worked in groups of ten or twelve. I usually was placed in a squad instructed by a big red-headed corporal who had been in a marine raider battalion during the fighting in the Solomon Islands. Big Red was good-natured but tough as nails. He worked us hard. One day he took us to a small rifle range and taught us how to fire a Japanese pistol, rifle, and heavy and light machine guns. After firing a few rounds from each, Red put about five of us into a pit about five feet deep with a one-foot embankment in front and the steep slope of a ridge behind as a backstop. One important thing you must learn fast to survive is exactly what enemy fire sounds like coming at you and what kind of weapon it is. Now when I blow this whistle, get down and stay down until you hear the whistle again. If you get up before the signal, you'll get your head blowed off and the folks back home will get your insurance. Red blew the whistle and we got down. He announced each type of Japanese weapon and fired several rounds from it over our hole into the bank. Then he and his assistants fired them all together for about 15 seconds. It seemed a lot longer. The bullets popped and snapped as they went over. Several machine gun tracers didn't embed in the bank, but bounced off and rolled white hot, sizzling and sputtering into the hole. We cringed and shifted about, but no one got burned. This was one of the most valuable training exercises we underwent. There were instances later on Peleliu and Okinawa which it prepared me to come through unscathed. A salty sergeant conducted bayonet training. He had been written about in a national magazine because he was so outstanding. On the cinder-covered street of an old raider camp, I witnessed some amazing feats by him. He instructed us in how to defend ourselves barehanded against an opponent's bayonet thrust. Here's how it's done, he said. He picked me out of the squad and told me to charge him and thrust the point of my bayonet at his chest when I thought I could stick him. I got a mental image of myself behind bars at Mare Island Naval Prison for bayoneting an instructor, so I veered off just before making my thrust. What the hell's the matter with you? Don't you know how to use a bayonet? But Sarge, if I stick you, they'll put me in Mare Island. There's less chance of you bayoneting me than of me whipping your ass for not following my orders. Okay, I thought to myself. If that's the way you feel about it, we have witnesses. So, I headed for him on the double and thrust at his chest. He sidestepped neatly, grabbed my rifle behind the front sight, and jerked it in the direction I was running. I held onto the rifle and tumbled onto the cinders. The squad roared with laughter. Someone yelled, Did you bayonet him, Sledgehammer? I got up looking sheepish. Knock it off, wise guy, said the instructor. You step up here, and let's see what you can do, big mouth. My buddy lifted his rifle confidently, charged, and ended up on the cinders too. The instructor made each man charge him in turn. He threw them all. He then took up a Japanese Arasaka rifle with fixed bayonet and showed us how the Japanese soldiers used the hooked handguard to lock onto the U.S. blade. Then, with a slight twist of his wrist, he could wrench the M1 rifle out of the opponent's hands and disarm him. He coached us carefully to hold the M1 on its side with the left side of the blade toward the deck instead of the cutting edge, as we had been taught in the States. This way, as we parried a Japanese's blade, he couldn't lock ours. 
We went on long hikes and forced marches through the jungles, swamps, and over endless steep hills. We made countless practice landings from Higgins boats on small islets off the coast. Each morning after chow, we marched out of camp equipped with rifles, cartridge belts, two canteens of water, combat pack, helmet, and K rations. Our usual pace was a rapid route step for 50 minutes with a 10-minute rest. But the officers and NCOs always hurried us and frequently deleted the 10-minute rest. When trucks drove along the road, we moved onto the sides as columns of infantry have done since early times. The trucks frequently carried army troops, and we barked and yapped like dogs and kidded them about being dog faces. During one of these encounters, a soldier hanging out of a truck just ahead of me shouted, Hey, soldier! You look tired and hot, soldier. Why don't you make the army issue you a truck like me? I grinned and yelled, Go to hell! His buddy grabbed him by the shoulder and yelled, Stop calling that guy, soldier! He's a marine. Can't you see his emblem? He's not in the army. Don't insult him! Thanks, I yelled. That was my first encounter with men who had no esprit. We might grumble to each other about our officers or the chow or the Marine Corps in general, but it was rather like grumbling about one's own family always with another member. If an outsider tried to get into the discussion, a fight resulted. One night during exercises in defense against enemy infiltration, some of the boys located the bivouac of Big Red and the other instructors who were supposed to be the infiltrators and stole their boondockers. When the time came for their offense to commence, they threw a few concussion grenades around and yelled like Japanese, but didn't slip out and capture any of us. When the officers realized what had happened, they reamed out the instructors for being too sure of themselves. The instructors had a big fire built in a ravine. We sat around it, drank coffee, ate K rations, and sang some songs. It didn't seem like such a bad war so far. All of our training was in rifle tactics. We spent no time on heavy weapons, mortars, and machine guns, because when we went up north, our unit commander would assign us where needed. That might not be in our specialties. As a result of the field exercises and obstacle coursework, we reached a high level of physical fitness and endurance. During the last week of May, we learned that the 46th Replacement Battalion would go north in a few days. We packed our gear and boarded the USS General Howes on 28 May 1944. This ship was quite different from the President Polk. It was much newer and apparently had been constructed as a troop ship. It was freshly painted throughout and spick and span. With only about a dozen other men, I was assigned to a small, well-ventilated compartment on the main deck. A far cry from the cavernous, stinking hole I bunked in on the Polk. The General Howes had a library from which troop passengers could get books and magazines. We also received our first Atabrine tablets. These small, bitter, bright yellow pills prevented malaria. We took one a day. On 2nd June, the General Howes approached the Russell Islands and moved into an inlet bordered by large groves of coconut palms. The symmetrical groves and clear water were beautiful. From the ship, we could see coral-covered roadways and groups of pyramidal tents among the coconut palms. This was Pavuvu, home of the 1st Marine Division. We learned we would debark the next morning, so we spent our time hanging over the rail, talking to a few marines on the pier. Their friendliness and unassuming manner struck me. Although clad neatly in khakis or dungarees, they appeared hollow-eyed and tired. They made no attempt to impress us green replacements, yet they were members of an elite division known to nearly everybody back home because of its conquest of Guadalcanal and more recent campaign at Cape Gloucester on New Britain. They had left Gloucester about 1st May. Thus, they had been on Pavuvu about a month. Many of us slept little during the night. We checked and rechecked our gear, making sure everything was squared away. The weather was hot, much more so than at New Caledonia. I went out on deck and slept in the open air. With a mandolin and an old violin, two of our marines struck up some of the finest mountain music I had ever heard. They played and sang folk songs and ballads most of the night. We thought it was mighty wonderful music. With the old breed... About near 900 the morning of 3rd June 1944, carrying the usual mountain of gear, I trudged down the gangplank of the General Howes. As we moved to waiting trucks, we passed a line of veterans waiting to go aboard for the voyage home. They carried only packs and personal gear, no weapons. Some said they were glad to see us because we were their replacements. They looked tanned and tired but relieved to be headed home. For them, the war was over. For us, it was just beginning. In a large parking area paved with crushed coral, a lieutenant called out our names and counted us off into groups. To my group of a hundred or more, he said, Third Battalion, Fifth Marines. 
If I had had an option and there was none, of course, as to which of the five Marine divisions I served with, it would have been the first Marine division. Ultimately, the Marine Corps had six divisions that fought with distinction in the Pacific. But the first Marine division was, in many ways, unique. It had participated in the opening American offensive against the Japanese at Guadalcanal and already had fought a second major battle at Cape Gloucester, north of the Solomon Islands. Now its troops were resting, preparing for a third campaign in the Palau Islands. Of regiments, I would have chosen the 5th Marines. I knew about its impressive history as a part of the 1st Marine Division, but I also knew that its record went back to France in World War I. Other Marines I knew in other divisions were proud of their units and of being Marines as well they should have been. But the 5th Marines and the 1st Marine Division carried not only the traditions of the Corps, but had traditions and a heritage of their own, a link through time with the old Corps. The fact that I was assigned to the very regiment and division I would have chosen was a matter of pure chance. I felt as though I had rolled the dice and won. No Marine division fought in World War I. The 5th and 6th Marine regiments fought in France as part of the 2nd Division. Regular American Expeditionary Force, AEF, a mixed unit of Marine and Army Brigades. But the 1st Marine Division was the only Marine division to fight in Korea. Along with the 3rd Marine Division, it also fought in Vietnam. It is, therefore, the sole Marine Division to have fought in all of our major wars during the past 60 years. Today, the 5th Marines still forms a part of the 1st Marine Division. Stationed on the West Coast, the division can deploy units for duty in the Western Pacific. The trucks drove along winding coral roads by the bay and through coconut groves. We stopped and unloaded our gear near a sign that said, 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines. An NCO assigned me to Company K. Soon a lieutenant came along and took aside the fifteen or so men who had received crew-served weapons, training mortars, and machine guns in the States. He asked each of us which weapon he wanted to be assigned to in the company. I asked for sixty min mortars and tried to look too small to carry a seventy-pound flamethrower. He assigned me to mortars, and I moved my gear into a tent that housed the second squad of the sixty miola mortar section. For the next several weeks, I spent most of my time during the day on work parties building up the camp. The top sergeant of Company K, First Sergeant Malone, would come down the company street shouting, all new men outside for a work party on the double. Most of the time the company's veterans weren't included. Pavuvu was supposed to be a rest camp for them after the long, wet, debilitating jungle campaign on Cape Gloucester. When Malone needed a large work party, he would call out, I need every available man. So we referred to him as Available Malone. None of us, old hands or replacements, could fathom why the division command chose Pavuvu. Only after the war did I find out that the leaders were trying to avoid the kind of situation the 3rd Marine Division endured when it went into camp on Guadalcanal after its campaign on Bougainville. Facilities on Guadalcanal, by then a large rear area base, were reasonably good, but the High Command ordered the 3rd Division to furnish about a thousand men each day for working parties all over the island. Not only did the Bougainville veterans get little or no rest, but when replacements came, the division had difficulty carrying out its training schedule in preparation for the next campaign, Guam. If Pavuvu seemed something less than a tropical paradise to us replacements fresh from the States and New Caledonia, it was a bitter shock to the Gloucester veterans. When ships entered McKitty Bay, as the General Howes had, Pavuvu looked picturesque. But once ashore, one found the extensive coconut groves choked with rotting coconuts. The apparently solid ground was soft and turned quickly to mud when subjected to foot or vehicular traffic. Pavuvu was the classical embodiment of the marine term boondocks. It was impossible to explain after the war what life on Pavuvu was like. Most of the griping about being rock-happy and bored in the Pacific came from men stationed at the big rear echelon bases like Hawaii or New Caledonia. Among their main complaints were that the ice cream wasn't good, the beer not cold enough, or the USO shows too infrequent. But on Pavuvu, simply living was difficult. For example, most of the work parties I went on in June and July were pick-and-shovel details to improve drainage or pave walkways with crushed coral just to get us out of the water. Regulations called for wooden decks in all tents, but I never saw one on Pavuvu. Of all the work parties, the one we hated most was collecting rotten coconuts. We loaded them onto trucks to be dumped into a swamp. 
If we were lucky, the coconut sprout served as a handle, but more often the thing fell apart, spilling stinking coconut milk over us. We made sardonic, absurd jokes about the vital, essential, classified work we were doing for the war effort and about the profundity and wisdom of the orders we received. In short, we were becoming Asiatic, a Marine Corps term denoting a singular type of eccentric behavior characteristic of men who had served too long in the Far East. I had done a good deal of complaining about Pavuvu's chow and general conditions during my first week there. One of the veterans in our company, who later became a close friend, told me in a restrained but matter-of-fact way that until I had been in combat, there was really nothing to complain about. Things could be a good deal worse, he said, and advised me to shut up and quit whining. He shamed me thoroughly. But for the first weeks on Pavuvu, the stench of rotting coconuts permeated the air. We could even taste it in the drinking water. I'm still repulsed even today by the smell of fresh coconut. The most loathsome vermin on Pavuvu were the land crabs. Their blue-black bodies were about the size of the palm of a man's hand, and bristles and spines covered their legs. These ugly creatures hid by day and roamed at night. Before putting on his boondockers each morning, every man in the 1st Marine Division shook his shoes to rouse the land crabs. Many mornings I had one in each shoe, and sometimes two. Periodically we reached the point of rage over these filthy things and chased them out from under boxes, sea bags, and cots. We killed them with sticks, bayonets, and entrenching tools. After the action was over, we had to shovel them up and bury them, or a nauseating stench developed rapidly in the hot, humid air. Each battalion had its own galley, but chow on Pavuvu consisted mainly of heated sea rations dehydrated eggs, dehydrated potatoes, and that detestable canned meat called Spam. The synthetic lemonade, so-called battery acid, that remained after chow was poured on the concrete slab deck of the galley to clean and bleach it. It did a nice job. As if hot sea rations didn't get tedious week in and week out, we experienced a period of about four days when we were served oatmeal morning, noon, and night. Scuttlebutt was that the ship carrying our supplies had been sunk. Whatever the cause, our only relief from monotonous chow was tidbits in packages from home. The bread made by our bakers was so heavy that when you held a slice by one side, the rest of the slice broke away of its own weight. The flour was so massively infested with weevils that each slice of bread had more of the little beetles than there are seeds in a slice of rye bread. We became so inured to this sort of thing, however, that we ate the bread anyway. The wit said, it's a good deal. Them beetles give you more meat in your diet. We had no bathing facilities at first. Shaving each morning with a helmet full of water was simple enough, but a bath was another matter. Each afternoon, when the inevitable tropical downpour commenced, we stripped and dashed into the company street, soap in hand. The trick was to lather, scrub, and rinse before the rain stopped. The weather was so capricious that the duration of a shower was impossible to estimate. Each downpour ended as abruptly as it had begun, and never failed to leave at least one or more fully lathered, cursing marines with no rinse water. Morning sick call was another bizarre sight during the early days on Pavuvu. The Gloucester veterans were in poor physical condition after the wettest campaign in World War II, during which men endured soakings for weeks on end. When I first joined the company, I was appalled at their condition. Most were thin, some emaciated, with jungle rot in their armpits and on their ankles and wrists. At sick call, they paired off with a bottle of gentian violet and cotton swabs, stood naked in the grove, and painted each other's sores. So many of them needed attention that they had to treat each other under a doctor's supervision. Some had to cut their boondockers into sandals because their feet were so infected with rot they could hardly walk. Needless to say, Pavuvu's hot, humid climate prolonged the healing process. I think the Marine Corps has forgotten where Pavuvu is, one man said. I think God has forgotten where Pavuvu is, came a reply. God couldn't forget because he made everything. Then I bet he wishes he could forget he made Pavuvu. This exchange indicates the feeling of remoteness and desolation we felt on Pavuvu. On the big island bases, men had the feeling of activity around their units and contact through air and sea traffic with other bases and with the states. On Pavuvu, we felt as though we were a million miles from not only home, but from anything else that bespoke of civilization. I believe we took in stride all of Pavuvu's discomforts and frustrations for two reasons. First, the division was an elite combat unit. 
Discipline was stern. Our esprit de corps ran high. Each man knew what to do and what was expected of him. All did their duty well, even while grumbling. NCOs answered our complaining with, Beat your gums. It's healthy. Or, what are you griping for? You volunteered for the Marine Corps, didn't you? You're just getting what you asked for. No matter how irritating or uncomfortable things were on Pavuvu, things could always be worse. After all, there were no Japanese, no bursting shells, no snapping and whining bullets, and we slept on cots. Second, makeup of the division was young. About 80% were between the ages of 18 and 25, about half were under 21 when they came overseas. Well-disciplined young men can put up with a lot even though they don't like it. And we were a bunch of high-spirited boys proud of our unit, but we had another motivating factor as well. A passionate hatred for the Japanese burned through all Marines I knew. The fate of the Gurch Patrol was the sort of thing that spawned such hatred. One day, as we piled stinking coconuts, a veteran Marine walked past and exchanged greetings with a couple of our old men. One of our groups asked us if we knew who he was. No, I never saw him, someone said. He's one of the three guys who escaped when the Gurch Patrol got wiped out on Guadalcanal. He was lucky as hell. Why did the Japs ambush that patrol? I asked naively. A veteran looked at me with unbelief and said slowly and emphatically, because they're the meanest people that ever lived. The Gurch Patrol incident, plus such Japanese tactics as playing dead and then throwing a grenade or playing wounded, calling for a corpsman and then knifing the medic when he came, plus the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, caused Marines to hate the Japanese intensely and to be reluctant to take prisoners. The attitudes held toward the Japanese by non-combatants or even sailors or airmen, often did not reflect the deep, personal resentment felt by marine infantrymen. Official histories and memoirs of marine infantrymen written after the war rarely reflect that hatred. But at the time of battle, marines felt it deeply, bitterly, and as certainly as danger itself. To deny this hatred or make light of it would be as much a lie as to deny or make light of the esprit de corps or the intense patriotism felt by the marines with whom I served in the Pacific. My experiences on Palilio and Okinawa made me believe that the Japanese held mutual feelings for us. They were a fanatical enemy. That is to say, they believed in their cause with an intensity little understood by many post-war Americans and possibly many Japanese as well. This collective attitude, Marine and Japanese, resulted in savage, ferocious fighting with no holds barred. This was not the dispassionate killing seen on other fronts or in other wars. This was a brutish, primitive hatred, as characteristic of the horror of war in the Pacific as the palm trees in the islands. To comprehend what the troops endured then and there, one must take into full account this aspect of the nature of the Marines War, probably the biggest boost to our morale about this time on Pavuvu, was the announcement that Bob Hope would come over from Banaka and put on a show for us. Most of the men in the division crowded a big open area and cheered as a piper cub circled over us. The pilot switched off the engine briefly, while Jerry Colonna poked his head out of the plane and gave his famous yell, Yeah, ow, 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 ow. We went wild with applause. Bob Hope, Colonna, Francis Langford, and Patty Thomas put on a show on a little stage by the pier. Bob asked Jerry how he liked the trip over from Banneker, and Jerry answered that it was tough sledding. When asked why, he replied, No snow. We thought it was the funniest thing we had ever heard. Patty gave several boys from the audience dancing lessons amid much grinning, cheering, and applause. Bob told many jokes and really boosted our spirits. It was the finest entertainment I ever saw overseas. Bob Hope's show remained the main topic of conversation as we got down to training in earnest for the coming campaign. Pavuvu was so small that most of our field exercises were of company size rather than battalion or regimental. Even so, we frequently got in the way of other units involved in their training exercises. It was funny to see a company move forward in combat formation through the groves and become intermingled with the rigid ranks of another company standing weapons inspection the officers shouting orders to straighten things out. We held numerous landing exercises several times a week. It seemed on the beaches and inlets around the island away from camp. We usually practiced from Amtrak's. 
The newest model had a tailgate that dropped as soon as the tractor was on the beach, allowing us to run out and deploy. Get off the beach fast. Get off the damn beach as fast as you can and move inland. The nips are going to plaster it with everything they've got, so your chances are better the sooner you move inland, shouted our officers and NCOs. We heard this over and over, day after day. During each landing exercise, we would scramble out of our tractors, move inland about 25 yards, and then await orders to deploy and push forward. The first wave of tractors landed rifle squads. The second wave landed more riflemen, machine gunners, bazooka gunners, flamethrowers, and 60 mm mortar squads. Our second wave typically trailed about 25 yards behind the first as the machines churned through the water toward the beach. As soon as the first wave unloaded, its Amtraks backed off, turned around, and headed past us out to sea to pick up supporting waves of infantry from Higgins boats circling offshore. It all worked nicely on Pavuvu, but there were no Japanese there. In addition to landing exercises and field problems before Palalio, we received refresher instructions and practice firing all small arms assigned to the company. M1 rifle, bar, carbine, .45 caliber pistol, and Thompson submachine gun. We also learned how to operate a flamethrower. During instruction with the flamethrower, we used a palm stump for a target. When my turn came, I shouldered the heavy tanks, held the nozzle in both hands, pointed at the stump about 25 yards away, and pressed the trigger. With a whoosh, a stream of red flame squirted out, and the nozzle bucked. The napalm hit the stump with a loud splattering noise. I felt the heat on my face. A cloud of black smoke rushed upward. The thought of turning loose hellfire from a hose nozzle as easily as I would water a lawn back home sobered me. To shoot the enemy with bullets or kill him with shrapnel was one of the grim necessities of war, but to fry him to death was too gruesome to contemplate. I was to learn soon, however, that the Japanese couldn't be routed from their island defences without it. About this time, I began to feel a deeper appreciation for the influence of the old breed on us newer marines. Gunnery Sergeant Haney provided a vivid example of their impact. I had seen Haney around the company area, but first noticed him in the shower one day because of the way he bathed. About a dozen naked, soapy replacements, including myself, stared in wide-eyed amazement and shuddered as Haney held his genitals in his left hand while scrubbing them with a G.I. brush the way one buffs a shoe. When you consider that the G.I. brush had stiff, tough, split-fiber bristles embedded in a stout wooden handle and was designed to scrub heavy canvas 782, web gear, dungarees, and even floors, Haney's method of bathing becomes truly impressive. I first saw him exert his authority one day on a pistol range where he was in charge of safety. A new second lieutenant, a replacement like myself, was firing from the position I was to assume. As he fired his last round, another new officer behind me called to him. The lieutenant turned to answer with his pistol in his hand. Haney was sitting next to me on a coconut log bench and hadn't uttered a word except for the usual firing range commands. When the lieutenant turned the pistol's muzzle away from the target, Haney reacted like a cat leaping on its prey. He scooped up a large handful of coral gravel and flung it squarely into the lieutenant's face. He shook his fist at the bewildered officer and gave him the worst bawling out I ever heard. Everyone along the firing line froze, officers as well as enlisted men. The offending officer, with his gold bars shining brightly on his collar, cleared his weapon, holstered it, and took off rubbing his eyes and blushing visibly. Haney returned to his seat as though nothing had happened. Along the firing line we thawed. Thereafter, we were much more conscious of safety regulations. Haney was about my size at 135 pounds, with sandy crew-cut hair and a deep tan. He was lean, hard, and muscular. Although not broad-shouldered or well-proportioned, his torso reminded me of some anatomy sketch by Michelangelo. Every muscle stood out in stark definition. He was slightly barrel-chested with muscles heaped up on the back of his shoulders so that he almost had a hump. Neither his arms nor his legs were large, but the muscles in them reminded me of steel bands. His face was small-featured with squinting eyes and looked as though it was covered with deeply tanned, wrinkled leather. Haney was the only man I ever knew in the outfit who didn't seem to have a buddy. He wasn't a loner in the sense that he was sullen or unfriendly. He simply lived in a world all his own. I often felt that he didn't even see his surroundings. All he seemed to be aware of was his rifle, his bayonet, and his leggings. He was absolutely obsessed with wanting to bayonet the enemy. 
We all cleaned our weapons daily, but Haney cleaned his M1 before muster at noon chow and after dismissal in the afternoon. It was a ritual. He would sit by himself, light a cigarette, field strip his rifle, and meticulously clean every inch of it. Then he cleaned his bayonet. All the while he talked to himself quietly, grinned frequently, and puffed his cigarette down to a stump. When his rifle was cleaned, he reassembled it, fixed his bayonet, and went through a few minutes of thrust, parry, and butt-stroke movements at thin air. Then Haney would light up another cigarette and sit quietly, talking to himself and grinning while awaiting orders. He carried out these proceedings as though totally unaware of the presence of the other 235 men of the company. He was like Robinson Crusoe on an island by himself. To say that he was Asiatic would be to miss the point entirely. Haney transcended that condition. The company had many rugged individualists, characters, old salts, and men who were Asiatic. But Haney was in a category by himself. I felt that he was not a man born of woman, but that God had issued him to the Marine Corps. Despite his personal idiosyncrasies, Haney inspired us youngsters in Company K. He provided us with a direct link to the old corps. To us, he was the old breed. We admired him and we loved him. Then there was Company K's commanding officer, Captain Akak Haldane. Bowdoin College annually honors the memory of Captain Haldane by presenting the Haldane Cup to the graduating senior who has displayed outstanding qualities of leadership and character. The cup was a gift from officers who had served with Captain Haldane in the Pacific. Among them was the late senator from Illinois, Paul Douglas, himself a member of the 5th Marines on Palaleu and Okinawa. I grinned at Haldane and said, Not exactly, sir. He recognized me as a replacement and asked how I liked the company. I told him I thought it was a fine outfit. You're a southerner, aren't you? he asked. I told him I was from Alabama. He wanted to know all about my family, home, and education. As we talked, the gloom seemed to disappear, and I felt warm inside. Finally, he told me it wouldn't rain forever, and we could get dry soon. He moved along the column, talking to other men as he had to me. His sincere interest in each of us as a human being helped to dispel the feeling that we were just animals training to fight. Acclaimed by superiors and subordinates alike for his leadership abilities, Captain Haldane was the finest and most popular officer I ever knew. All of the Marines in Company K shared my feelings. Called the Skipper, he had a strong face full of character, a large, prominent jaw, and the kindest eyes I ever saw. No matter how often he shaved or how hard he tried, he always had a five o'clock shadow. He was so large that the combat pack on his back reminded me of the bulge of his wallet, while mine covered me from neck to waist. Although he insisted on strict discipline, the captain was a quiet man who gave orders without shouting. He had a rare combination of intelligence, courage, self-confidence, and compassion that commanded our respect and admiration. We were thankful that Akak was our skipper, felt more secure in it, and felt sorry for other companies not so fortunate. While some officers on Pavuvu thought it necessary to strut or order us around to impress us with their status, Haldane quietly told us what to do. We loved him for it, and did the best job we knew how. Our level of training rose in August, and so did the intensity of chicken discipline. We suffered through an increasing number of weapons and equipment inspections, work parties, and petty clean-up details around the camp. The step-up in harassment, coupled with the constant discomforts and harsh living conditions of Pavuvu, drove us all into a state of intense exasperation and disgust with our existence before we embarked for Palelio. I used to think the lieutenant was a pretty good Joe, but damned if I'm not about decided he isn't nothing but a hoss's ass, grumbled one Marine. You said that right, old buddy, came back another. Hell, he isn't the only one that's gone crazy over insisting that everything be just so, and then bawling us out if it isn't. The gunny's mean as hell, and nothing suits him any more, responded yet another man. Don't let it get you down, boys. It's just part of the USMC plan for keeping the troops in fighting shape calmly remarked a philosophical old salt of pre-war service. What the hell you talking about? snapped an irritated listener. Well, it's this way, answered the philosopher. If they get us mad enough, they figure we'll take it out on the nips when we hit this beach coming up. I saw it happen before Guadalcanal and Gloucester. They don't pull this kind of stuff on rear echelon boys. They want us to be mean, mad, and malicious. That's straight dope, I'm telling you. I've seen it happen every time before we go on a campaign. Sounds logical. 
You may be right, but what's malicious, someone said. Forget it, you nitwit, the philosopher growled. Right or not, I'm sure tired of Pavuvu, I said. That's the plan, Sledgehammer. Get you fed up with Pavuvu, or wherever the hell you happen to be, and you'll be hot to go anywhere else, even if the nips are there waiting for you, the philosopher said. We fell silent, thinking about that, and finally concluded he was right. Many of the more thoughtful men I knew shared his view. I griped as loudly as anyone about our living conditions and discipline. In retrospect, however, I doubt seriously whether I could have coped with the psychological and physical shock and stress encountered on Palilio and Okinawa had it been otherwise. The Japanese fought to win. It was a savage, brutal, inhumane, exhausting, and dirty business. Our commanders knew that if we were to win and survive, we must be trained realistically for it, whether we liked it or not. On Topelelu, in late August, we completed our training. About the 26th, Company K boarded LST, landing ship, tank 6 and Skjavn for a voyage that would end three weeks later on the beach at Palalia. Each rifle company assigned to the assault waves against Palalia made the trip in an LST carrying the Amtraks that would take the men ashore. Our LST lacked sufficient troop compartment space to accommodate all of the men of the company, so the platoon leaders drew straws for the available space. The mortar section got lucky. We were assigned to a troop compartment in the forecastle with an entrance on the main deck. Some of the other platoons had to make themselves as comfortable as possible on the main deck under and around landing boats and gear secured there. Once loaded, we weighed anchor and headed straight for Guadalcanal, where the division held maneuvers in the Tassafaronga area. This area bore little resemblance to the beaches we would have to hit on Palalia, but we spent several days in large and small unit amphibious landing exercises. Some of our Guadalcanal veterans wanted to visit the island cemetery to pay their respects to buddies killed during the division's first campaign. The veterans I knew were not allowed to make the trip to the cemetery, and there was a great deal of understandable bitterness and resentment on their part because of this. Between training exercises, some of us explored the beach area and looked over the stranded wrecks of Japanese landing barges the troop ship Yamazuki Maru, and a two-man submarine. One of the Guadalcanal veterans told us what a helpless feeling it had been to sit back in the hills and watch Japanese reinforcements come ashore unopposed during the dark days of the campaign when the Japanese navy was so powerful in the Solomon Islands. Evidence of earlier fighting remained in the goodly number of shattered trees and several human skeletons we found in the jungle growth. We also had our lighter moments. When the Amtraks returned us to the LST each afternoon, we hurried to our quarters, stowed our gear, stripped, and went below to the tank deck. After all the Amtraks were aboard, the ship's commanding officer obligingly left the bow doors open and the ramp down so we could swim in the blue waters of Sea Lark Channel, called more appropriately Iron Bottom Bay, because of all the ships that had been sunk there during the Guadalcanal campaign. We dove, swam, and splashed in the beautiful water like a bunch of little boys, and for a few fleeting hours forgot why we were there. 